In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Glory to thee, O Christ, our God, and our hope. Glory to thee. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. Implant also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all kind of desires we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and unto thee we ascribe glory together with thine unoriginate Father and thine all holy, good, and life giving Spirit now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, God willing, uh, tonight we will cover chapters 14, 15, and 16, the last three chapters of the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Um, um, before we, uh, we closed in um, um, in chapter 13 and um, in the previous uh, basically chapters 12 and 13 we were talking about um, anybody can remind us what are the points that we covered about speaking in tongues speaking in tongues is definitely one of them definitely yeah. And then right in the beginning of chapter 13, there was another very, very important point about what? About love. About love, right? That if I don't have love in anything I do, what is going to happen? It's yeah. nothing. Right? It's worthless. Whatever I do, whatever I do, if I don't have love, which means at the end of the day, we saw, because we saw in chapter 13, love becoming... Um, uh, especially in, in uh, verse 4 to verse 7, it talks about how love is what? Uh, love as a subject, right? Uh, as if like, you know, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. So technically, or in, in essence, who is this love then? God, right? God, Christ. And so we are asked to always have God, Christ in us in anything we do, which means how do we mean we have God in us is when we act like him, right? When we when we sacrifice, when we uh, act humbly, when we forgive, when we um, uh, uh, be humble, and all of you know all of this that means God for us uh, at least that what it means what love at the end um, uh, to be Christ-like exactly to be Christ-like and then of course like Tina said we did speak about the uh, uh, speaking in tongues and that was for Saint Paul to dedicate that much um, uh, or that much uh, of you know uh, text. Uh, for it, that means it was a problem, right? But what did we get to know from speaking in tongues? Like, what was his position on it? If you can remember, what do you think? Was he okay with it? Was he like encouraging it? Was he ranking, ranking it one of the best or the highest um, uh, gifts that God might give someone? What do you think? I don't want you to be like sound as a test. Just what you know, just that's why you know it's a discussion. We talk. We say you know. Go ahead, Dalil. I think uh, what he was trying to say it's not for everybody. Okay, it's not for everybody. Okay, uh, that's that's very good, right? It's like if anybody speaks in tongues, um, that will be few chosen people. It's not like something that just anybody can pick up. Okay, but where does he rank it? Is it something that it's important, or he said there is something even more important than it? Wasn't it considered like a gift? Okay, okay, it is a gift. It is a gift. Some people might have it, but it, like Dalal said, it's not like everybody can do it. It's not like specifically God might choose few people that they can do that. But what does he also say? Be what's like more apostles to minister okay. 
to, okay, so that would lead at the end because he talks about speaking in tongues. This is like this special talent that you might have with God. But if there was no one to explain it, it no one like you know what's the what's the point of it? And we'll see in chapter fourteen what he's going to add to it. But the point, his point is, it's like I don't want people to think too much about it. It is just a, it's a talent that is not more important than any other talent. If anything, there are other ones that it's more important, especially the ones where you do think you teach when you profit or, you know, you, know, you teach or you act like God. OK, so because what's happening is even in the um, uh, uh, in the Greeks and the, the pagan uh, communities, those things of like just speaking all kinds of languages, uh, like none, you, you know, words that don't understand, people don't understand. It was a common practice also in the pagans, in the pagan religion. So he's saying it just at the end, maybe, and there are people who spoke in tongues, some kind of a special relation, like a special talent that some people in the early church had it, but it's not, St. Paul is making sure like Dalal said, it's not like everybody can say it. Everybody just can, you know, do this. Nor it's that much of an important. There are many other talents that you should succeed in it. And you should exceed in it. Because on its own, oh, it's like, okay, some people who had some kind of a relationship, you know, with like, I shouldn't say relationship with God. Like, it is a, um, a talent that they've had, special gift. Um, and people say, like, what does that even mean? Like, what would they, even if it's the ones like in church that we had really had people who speak in tongues, that's a way to communicate with God. How we don't know. Um, uh, at the end, we know that nothing we can say in words satisfy who God is. Like, if I say God is great, the word great is not enough to. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, it's to explain it. That's why in our liturgy, in our um, theology, in our faith, uh, we use, if I'm not mistaken, an emphatic language. I think that's what it's called. Um, emphatic language is that what it's called? I should have. Uh, no, wait. Let me just. Uh, so basically, and you tell me what you know if that's the right word for it. So. We we can't we we don't we say God is uncontainable. Um, uh, we say God is incomprehensible. It's always the what He is not because we can't say what He is uh, because whatever we say He is, it's not even enough. So the point is, there is no word in our whatever we say to God cannot really explain you know uh, 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 really explain who he is or something about him so we use i'm pretty sure that's what it's called emphatic um give me one second it's like i didn't think Infor about it informatic is that what you're trying to say i don't know no I mean, let me just say what uh or that you're doing emphatic, that didn't know um Tending to express oneself in forcible speech or take this no, that's not the word then. Um, I, I I can I can look at it for, for another time. I just I didn't think about it before. Um, so what, when we talk about God, we always say we use the negative that He's not this, He's not this because whatever we say, if He is, again, if we say He's uncontainable, like He cannot be contained anything. So be, instead of saying, oh, He's so vast, He's just. He's everywhere. Well, it's actually even beyond these words. So we use the uh, opposite. I don't. There is a word for it. I just can't remember it now. Anyway, um, the, the point is, there were people that they had this uh, gift of speaking in tongues, but it was not something that common that anybody can just do it. Um, I did think maybe I can share with you a video, um, not to like... I don't want to like. I don't want to seem that it's uh, disrespect people or anything like this. But infallible, you meant Abuna, Abuna, you meant infallible, uh, unable to make mistakes. What is it, Jamil? Uh, the, the infallible, back to infallible. 
is not to make any. Not infallible. That's another mistake. word. But all, uh, so, uh, not not the word. I'll I'll I'll, I'll get I'll get the oh, word. Sorry about that. Um, sorry. But but that's I mean he's also this is also from God's that he um, uh, um, that he's always right. He's never wrong. Definitely, it's one of his um, uh, qualities. Uh, but I do want to show you that how it's most likely that's how speaking in tongues, even in the early pagan uh, churches, um, uh, sound. Um, let me. Uh, so I think Father John, like what the, this whole, you know, the speaking in tongues may be like the end of the world type of language for the oh, uh, no. elite. We don't know. We don't say, I mean, we don't know if it's, it's not, I won't say it's a length. I mean, somehow some kind of a connection that people can somehow God give them a talent to utter words that don't make sense to people. Um, but again, would that be the, the language after we have? I mean, we cannot assume we cannot assume this. We, we don't know. Um, but I just want to show you. I mean, it's it's funny in a way, but like that's how it is most likely um, uh, back in the days. Uh, let me see. Can you? Can you? Can you hear? Can you see the screen? Okay. You ready? Can you hear? He's drunk as a bad. It's muted. Go ahead. Let that Holy Ghost language come up out of you. Go ahead. Father, are you able to raise the volume? Raise the volume? Mm -hmm. You know, actually, probably what I have to do is on the Zoom. Uh, give me one second. Stop share. Um, there is a oh yeah the audio. microphone something with the mic right yeah audio setting like you have to share but i thought it was already on uh video it always display participant da, 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 advanced running video rendering video render method uh, share screen full screen man. okay enable the remote Silence, system notification machine sharing desktop. Share desktop. Hmm. Let's see, advanced. Limit your screen, screen sharing, invitation. Oh, I don't know why it's doing it. I mean, before I've had it, accessibility, that's not it. So you were not able to, to hear, right? Just the first couple words. Yeah, it was very, very low. Okay, although before, okay. Uh, somehow, okay, share screen audio. Mm -hmm. Press full screen synchronize. Anyway, I, I mean, I don't want to much, uh, um, I don't want to actually, I don't want to spend too much on, uh, time on it. But at least, did you see how he basically comes up to him and says, Let the Holy Ghost, you know, speak through you? And all of a sudden, this guy is just like, oh, Shut up, whatever. He utters literally words like this. And you can't find thousands of videos like this. And most likely that's how the early church probably like those pagans were, you know, take like that's how they're acting with speaking in tongues. They're just like making it like a somehow that they're special and look uh, uh, God or, you know, all these like gods are speaking through me to the point. That's why he also says, St. Paul, like watch out if it doesn't say if the teachings coming out of this mouth, the, the mouth of these people Whoever is interpreting them or if they speak about what they experiencing, if it goes against the, the faith, then it's not from God. That it's actually people, these, you know, made up these things. That it's just not, that's not right. Because there was so much emphasis on speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. It's, it's like all of, like, as if, as if everybody is like, if you don't speak in tongues, somehow you're not worthy or you're not good. And he's telling them that has, no, maybe the, some people. It's always uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit too. To, uh, to, to, yeah, I mean, to the Holy Spirit that. is is in every is everywhere, and gives different, uh, different, uh, equal, different, but equal talents to everyone. 
So my talent might be different than your talent, but it's all good in front of God. Anyway, that's the speaking uh, um, uh, in tongue. Um, any other questions on speaking tongues? Complaints, comments, questions? Okay, should we do chapter 14? Who would like to read 14? Dee, can you have someone? Uh... I have uh, Tina. Yeah. Could you please yeah. unmute? It seems to be I'm first all the time, so I might as well do it. 14, right? Yes. Prophecy superior to tongues. Do you want me to read the whole thing? E actually, how's it really going to be come together? Um, yeah, well, let's do till 25. Because he's speaking about more and more about, uh, you know, uh, speaking in tongues. Okay. Okay. Prophecy superior to tongues. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophecy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. How, well, there you go right there. No one understands him. So how can they say what he's saying if they don't even understand him? However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesizing, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise, you un so likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brethren, do not be children in understanding, however, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to these people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed and unbelievers, will they not say that you're out of your mind? But if all prophecy in an unbeliever or in an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Okay, you tell me what do you think what, what is he saying in this? Uh, what, to be what, honest, uh, I think he's saying that the, if we can't understand the language, then how is it from God? Even though we have all these other languages, we still know how to communicate it. But in tongues, you really don't. 
And talk, he even says, I think it's a you know, crock of is what I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because in a way, what do we know? What do we know that what's what's being said? It could be something completely opposite of right. what we're there for. It could be somebody right. I don't know praising it could be the demonic devil. for all we know. Who knows? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. when if there was any unbelievers between the things, they would never understand what he's saying, and they might say amen without knowing what's happening. <laughs> And what's the point then? What's the point of like spreading the faith? You know, if somebody goes in there and like has no idea what it is, it's just like right. gibberish, exactly. right? So the whole point exactly. at the end of the day, it's an easy claim, right? I can claim I'm speaking in tongues. God is speaking through me. It's an easy claim, right? So people will take advantage to like bring attention to themselves and praise themselves. And he's saying, that's not the point. Yes, there might be some people that have that special talent but not everyone does. Even he says about himself, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. But what kind of tongues we hear, we see in other epistles that he says, he doesn't tell, says that he, he himself, but he'll say, St. Paul says that he went to the ninth uh, heaven. Like he, he had some encountering like the same one he had on his way to Damascus for his conversion. That he has other encounters where he experienced God. But he said at the end of the day, what good about it? Yet in the church, this is such an important look at uh, verse 18, 18, 19. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Also, Abuna was I read it. I read somewhere, mm. and I don't remember where, that, and there should be somebody who can interpret what's being said. Exactly, right. Exactly. That otherwise, the people would not understand it. I, I don't recall if it was in the Bible or somewhere else. I read it. No, that no. He, actually, actually, did she just when you were out of the screen? Tina just read that. He does say, oh, and that I literally in this paragraph, he has saying, it. Um, oh, therefore, let him who speaks in the tongue pray that he might interpret. For if I pray in tongues, in tongue my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What's the conclusion? I will pray with the spirit. I will sing and I will also... Ta -ta -ta -ta, okay, but there is one that we just... Uh, um, we have one should speak and he speaks for to me. Anyway, he just... Oh, right there. Uh, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets. Mm. That he has to, somebody has to interpret. Somebody has to tell, or else what's the point? At the end of the day, what's, what's the point of my faith if I don't share it? If I can't, you know, teach others? It's like, okay, it's good that I had my own revelation with Christ. Fine. But it's, what good about it? Uh, it's not as as or it's not more important than teaching someone about the faith, telling someone about the faith. So, if, really, if God told you something, then might as well share it with others, interpret it. Okay, what else? Um, so, at the end of the day, who prophesies? And always, when we say prophesies, not just like the one who tells about the future, right? I mean, prophet is the one who. It's usually known as, oh, the one who basically speaks about the future. But not it's it's not only that. It's part of the stuff that maybe a, prof, a prophet might prophesize, say something coming in the future. But it's usually prophesized as the one who speaks on behalf of God, that he is the tongue of God. So it can be just a teaching, not about like, oh, in three days at this time, this going to happen. I mean, maybe. That's part of a prophet, you know, what a prophet can do, but it's more of, uh, it's like, no, like speaking, teaching, talking, like saying, uh, 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 giving a lesson, speaking on behalf of God, being the tongue and the mouth of God. So St. Paul is saying, this one who prophesies is more important than speaking in tongues. Why? Because there is edif edification, right? In, in verse 3, but he who prophesies uh, speaks edification, 
an exhortation. Exhortation, yani ershed, like teaching. He's teaching, and comfort for men, and consolation. He is um, he is of more value to the common good. The one who prophesies, he's more important. He or she is more important than the one in a way that just like utters word that no one, no one words that no one else understands. So this whole chapter fourteen, at least this whole part. That is basically saying, don't, don't, don't fall into this, you know, speaking in, uh, in tongues that somehow is special. Uh, not, it's not much special. It's not much special. So, any other questions about this, Steve? I'm sorry if somebody asked this question already, but today in the Orthodox Church. In, in today's world, do we have prophets? Again, so so when we say about prophets, not only people that who, um, like, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Like prophesize, like they're going to tell us what's the future, right? Because at the end, it was more of a term in preparation for Christ. So who is the last prophet? I don't know if John I lost the Baptist, it. John the Baptist. Bravo. So St. John the Baptist is the, we can call him the, 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 the end of prophets, the ones who were saying like, oh, this is coming, it's going to happen in a way. Right? So we don't have titles in a way now like St. So-and-so the prophet, like after St. John the Baptist. Um, but part of also prophet is the one who speaks the like again to be the mouth and tongue of God to teach a lesson. So we have many saints now. I mean, technically, every each one of us who teaches is kind of a prophet. When you speak the word of God, when you're uttering the, the, the words of God and giving some kind of a teaching, that's in a way prophecy. Although, but, yes, somebody said something. Oh, uh, this is it, Steve again. Uh, like there's references even in the New Testament, like the uh, of church members predicting so like a famine in the future. Sure, we need to get sure. ready. Sure, or I sure. believe some of the history of the saints have been able to. Oh, sure. Even even till the nineties, Saint Paisius has a whole thing about uh, you know about uh, prophecy about Turkey and about Constantinople. That I should explain it in a way better in this way. Um, prophet is usually was a term to indicate speaking, preparing the way for the Messiah to come. In two things, either telling about him, well, telling about him, this Messiah, like there will be somebody coming to do this, to do this, to do this, and also part of their part of their work as a prophet is to teach. So with uh, St. John the Baptist, that was the, I, like, that was what is really a prophet. Then there is, of course, there are saints after, again, till, till today, probably, they would have that kind of a vision that they can say, oh, there is something in the, in the future is going to happen. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen. It might change. Um, but mainly to say a prophet, it was the one who prepares the way for a Messiah, who talks about the Messiah coming. So telling about events that he's going to do, this Messiah, and speaking as in a way of like teachings, like uttering words of wisdom. Um, but tilted, I mean, again, nowadays, uh, the, the prophecy of uh, uh, the prophecies of St. Paisios are always um circulated talking about like oh turkey is gonna fall soon and look what he says about constantinople and it's gonna come back and all of these and all of these things but maybe maybe not so we might still hear the word prophet uh which is yeah some people have that kind of uh you know we have saints or we, not even say i mean even they're not yet saints or at least they haven't uh, departed this life but uh, they can read you while you're, you know, just the the uh, the fact that they talk to you. 
and they can tell you, oh, you've done this, you've done, you're doing this, and you're gonna, this is what's going to happen to you. So it is kind of a prophet a prophecy, but they don't get a title, a prophet, like after they got the after they depart this life and become like, I don't know, Saint Paisius the prophet. You're not gonna, you know, he won't get that title. Maybe, yes. No. There's gonna be fake prophets. Fake prophets that we're probably expecting, right? Well, we do say there were, you know, Christ says there will be fake prophets after me who will just teach wrong things. But we're talking here, even some Orthodox or some Christian who actually claim things that may be in prophet, you know, it's something that might happen in the future, that, but also it might not happen. Uh, I, I think I'm losing my connection or my connection is weak. I don't know if you can still hear me. Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Father, can I ask a question? Sure, I saw. Sure, sure. Um, so would John the Baptist be considered the last prophet of the Old mm -hmm. Testament and then Christ the old prof uh the old the, the latest prophet of the New Testament? No. So Saint John, def again, the proper um uh title or the prophet definition of a prophet as known in the church that the one who's prepared who's preparing the way or talking or prophesizing about the messiah about the christ so christ i mean he speaks you know in the tongue of you know he speaks on behalf of god right so in a way he is a prophet but no it's like everybody is preparing like he's i don't want to go too deep in it but um, St. John the Baptist is, we say, he's the closure of prophets. No one after St. John the Baptist will get the title of prophet. You know, after him, Christ came in, nothing. You know, we don't need any more somebody to tell us about the Messiah. The Messiah is there. Now, there are things that a prophet, the title still, but like people who spoke after Christ, after you know uh, his resurrection and ascent back to heaven, that they might still utter words that they're prophesizing. I mean, that's but we don't. It's not the proper prophet. So that's why we you're you're not, you're not going to find probably any saint in the church after that his title is you know saint so and so the prophet. Uh, because Christ is considered he's who whom everyone was prophesizing about in the Old Testament. Salim? Salim is. So probably we can say um, we, we don't accept pro prophesying. You know, if somebody is prophesying, then that is not true, probably, right? No, no, no. There no, is we won't. people that tell the future uh, is not looked at properly in in Christianity. Is is that probably a good conclusion? So, so, so definitely, we don't believe in you know reading the palms and like all of these like superstitions. Of course, you know that's why part of that we don't believe that there are you know Christ said that uh, wrong prophets will come in and fake prophets. We don't believe in this because at the end you also want to see what kind of things they're uttering. Is it about the church? Is it about Christ? Is it about like what kind of a prophet's like into you know next week you're gonna hit the lottery and win I don't know million dollars or something like that's who cares I mean I care I don't mind a million dollars but the point it's not like it's not something that at the end the outcome of it is something you know talking about Christ about the church about how to behave how to pray how to be a good Christian again there are still some saints. That we know they passed away or they're still alive that they can see that you know they can tell you about things might happen in the future or might tell you things about you that you're going to do you know next week or next year or in 10 years so again we don't call them uh like we don't define them as prophets prophets but that does not mean if they you know they don't see things in the future Maybe. Actually, I think also St. Mm. Paul talks about it. He says, uh, you have to be a believer 
to prophesy it. At least that. Exactly. So, um, exactly. but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So, you have to be a believer in the so church. Yeah. But I'll give you an example. You know, I've said it before about Jonah. What did God tell Jonah? What did what, like what, what was his main mission? What did he send him for, like to do? To go preach in Nineveh or something like that. Right? Yes, yes. And what does he tell them? Like, what did he prophesize? He's prophet, right? What did he prophesize to the Nineveh people? That they were going to get destroyed or destruction or something was coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did they get destroyed? No, because they repented, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So even. Even sometimes if somebody might prophesy something, God might, I wouldn't say God changes his mind, not like this, but like things might change. Things even prophet, like just, that's why speaking about the future is not that much of an important, like, it's not like, oh my gosh, somebody says this, that's going to happen. Like actually might change because it's the way how we, that's how we, you know, we, we conduct our life. Might change that. So, I think, I think if I understand correctly, I think the struggle is we always associate prophecy with just pre, uh, um, uh, um, knowing the future, but it's not just it. The, the prophecy at the end of the day, mainly is to speak about Christ, about the coming Messiah. That's why. It was very common in the Old Testament. And also to speak on behalf of God. With the New Testament, Christ has come. Tell us. Um, still people might, you know, because of their ascetic life, because of how uh, spiritual, how high, um, how they, uh, uh, they live a very high spiritual life, that they're able to foresee things. But it's not like this is the official meaning of a prophet because as a prophet like again that's what he or she has to do tell him i, I see your hand i don't know if you it's the same hand or you're yeah hand. just it's something uh that i struggle with and it's you know uh one on the one hand god knows everything including the future and on the other we have free will meaning at, at some point, and that, you know, I don't expect it, you know, we'll discuss it now, but it's something with, you know, in terms of prophesying, I can't kind of see them together. Uh, well, the, I mean, we definitely, that would be the whole session, that would be the whole talk. But like I said to Steve, look at uh, um, uh, Nineveh people, the people of Nineveh. Like God tells, I mean, in the end, God might know, I mean, knows, right? He knows that we believe that he knows everything, like you said. So he knows that they, they're going to repent, but this is what they're going to tell them if they don't repent. But still, he wanted to tell them to make sure that was the wake-up call for them, right? That was the wake-up call for them that he had to send, because uh, uh, if, he, if he hasn't sent, if he didn't send the, uh, uh, Jonah, they probably would have repented because God has to still respect their free will. But we can talk a whole session about like free will and God knows knowing everything. That is, it's a very, very, it's a very good point, Sally. That would need like a lot of like. It's it's a good a good subject. It's a good subject, but definitely we can talk about it in. 10, 15 minutes. I just, we need to talk. What does it mean to be, to have a free will and all of, the, like, try to see the connection between them? Um, to, 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 um, okay. I we got that. I got Dalal to read next. Okay. Dalal, can you finish chapter 14? So from verse 26 to the end, please. Yes. Um, how is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, 
has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edit edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let be and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy, for ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. That your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore... Brethren, COVID to prophecy, COVID to prophecy, COVID, sorry, to prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Thank you. What do you think? What is it here that he's talking about? I'm sure every man will be happy to say, oh, yeah, he doesn't want God. Uh, St. Paul says that women just should keep silence in churches. That's probably one of many men's favorite uh, verse. I think he's trying to say that, you know, if there's people that are speaking in tongue, you know, there has to be somebody that's going to translate for the others. Because So, so what is the main point of that part b before we get into uh, verse uh, 34? So from 26 to 33, what is the main point you think? Don't speak in tongue. No okay, way. more than this. Look at the verse 26, at the end of 26. Let all things be done for edification. Edification. So again, this whole thing, we can see, we see this in all this letter um, that people are only caring about them themselves in general. They're doing things for their own edification. They're talking, they're doing things for their own glory. They're not thinking about anybody else. It's all about their own thing. And he's telling them, do not do anything in the church without in mind having in mind the edification of the other. That what is it's not just what you think you're gonna profit. It's not about you, it's about everybody, it's about the other that you're here to worship and all of this for the other person. Okay. I saw Jeff. Jeff, did you have your hand up? I was just going to point out the part later on where he talks about, um, mm -hmm. I think it's verse 32, where he says, um, or 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of mm -hmm. peace. And, you know, and if what they're doing is just creating a hubbub or, a, you know, being all getting attention and creating chaos, then that's not from God. Absolutely. 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 And then he speaks about, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in the church. Do you think that he is that much harsh on women? What if their husbands are not as holy or educated? 
That's a good question. But is he is is Saint Paul? Do you think that much harsh on women? Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't think so. But... I mean, by today's standards, absolutely. Oh. I'm not talking about today. Well, that's the problem <laughs> at the end of the day. But that's the problem. We pick and choose what we want to hear and what we want to to to, to read, and we take things way out of context. Yeah. Right, we take it's just like this sentence. I got got this sentence on Christ on on Saint Paul or whoever. Therefore, oh, this is all bad. This is all you know. This is not in our standard. No, no way. But is he? Let's oh, Nicolette. I see your hand. I mean, I would think at that time, uh, it's not about the woman getting it. Uh, if a woman spoke out it would get the attention to her and it wouldn't be about the message or edification of the people that need mm. to hear the message. So people would understand and comprehend and accept the message if it came from someone other than a woman because a woman would bring attention to herself as a woman as opposed to the message that she's given out. I would think mm. at that time. Sure, that's definitely a good, very valid point. Uh, the good, valid point, but also not to say, but as if to deny what you said. No, like, but on top of that, um, okay, let's read verse 28. What does he say in 28? Um, read, but if there is no interpreter, let him keep what in the church? Let him speak to himself and God. So. Silent, silent. The word, the better word is silent, right? So it's not like just he's targeting women. He's telling others to speak to, um, uh, uh, to be silent too. But what, at least according to Farley, um, the book I usually use mostly, you know, rely on the uh, the Bible study. He does write, Saint Paul had no issue for women to pray even and prophesy. Like he had no issue for them to say prayers, probably in our time now, it's like chanting. They can do the chant and prophesy. They can even speak. They can even teach because he never um, excluded them from any other place. Have you seen any place that says pray, but no women should pray? Or prophesize, but no uh, uh, women should prophesize. No, so it's not like he just uh, um, uh, uh, he's not telling them to uh, to be uh, to be silent just in general. He does probably mean that he does not want them to speak when it comes to discerning and correcting the prophets. Or so. Um, um, so, again, according to Farley, he's probably, what he means, he, women, like also maybe other people, other men, if they are not the elders, they should not be speaking and correcting uh, a people, the prophets, or the ones who are teaching. Like somebody says, you know, I had a revelation, God wants me to tell you this, I'm uttering these words. The church or the elders of that church, in our terms now, will be the clergy. Whoever is in charge, whoever these people in charge, will have to validate what they're what this person is saying. That if someone says, "Oh, Christ is not the Son of God," well, of course, as elders, they're going to say this is not this is not acceptable. This is not should not be uh, you know accepted. So there are these elders who will validate. The, the the words and and what um what you know what these prophets or these teachers are saying saint paul is saying it seems that they were women that they were like playing the words if i can or not playing the words um they're making themselves as to be like elders like they would uh, uh make themselves like they would speak as if like they're elders or uh, uh it's like now basically a woman saying that you know i want to speak on behalf of the priest i want to 
you know, I know more than, you know, I want to uh, 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 play the role of a priest. So most likely that's what he means because he, he's not only silent women, he silenced everybody else in other places. Um, so he's most likely what he's trying to do, what, what he's doing is telling them not to discern and correct the teachers and the prophets. Because probably that's what was happening, that they're speaking somehow, they're speaking um, um, when it's not their time to speak. And that's not their position, nor their time to speak. Uh, Salim? Yeah, he, at the end of uh, at the end of thirty five, he says he gives the reason for it is shameful for women to speak in church, so it's more cultural than spiritual or religious. That that's how I you know shame shame is is not religious but cultural. Hey, so th that's why I could not. I mean, that's why I agreed with Nicolette. Uh, it's not again. Remember when he told them cover the head but not cover the head, and he's like, eh. You don't want to cover, don't cover. But like, because of the society, covering your head, it's not going to make a difference. Covering your head or not covering your head, it's not going to make the difference, right? Um, it's not like, that's not what the faith is about. But um, because of the culture, cover your head. Um, and of course, probably that's what he's also telling them. He'd like, it's not probably common for women to speak in a way, uh, to comment on things. But definitely he does not silence them with other things. He doesn't sil exclude them from praying. He doesn't tell them you cannot pray, you cannot read, you cannot do, you know, you cannot teach. It's just there are places that you're not supposed to speak because uh, um, you're, this is not your job. It is someone, somebody else's job. So the point is... Um, only the elders, even if another man wanted to speak to comment or correct the teachers, that's not his job. It's specific people that they can discern and correct the teachings if they're wrong when they're wrong. Because there's no way, St. Paul somehow, in any of these letters, that there's something degrading for women, God forbid. If anything, we always say, no one like unless you really take you know one word or one sentence and you say oh look what it says it's like no it's like when people say oh look how degrading the bible is it says uh saint paul says in ephesians uh the man is the head of the woman like in genesis like oh look how you know how um disrespectful and um uh, um uh, what's the other word look, at least this dis disrespectful for women and it's like, no, it, why are you just taking those two words? It says the man is the head of the, the, the woman, like Christ is the head of the church. And as Christ gave himself for the church, died for the church, the man must die for his wife. That never, never, ever the, um, uh, um, uh, the man should care about himself before he cares about his wife. That he must always cares uh, for his wife be, before him. How beautiful that is. Which even in this world we don't even have it. But. Anyway. Um, uh, to, 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 the land has a. The oh, land has a question. When you okay. said cover your head. Were you, were you referencing to covering your head when you go to church and pray or was this also part of the christian culture where it no was i mean we know from the culture back then almost all religions have their women cover their heads and if you're not even pagans that was like more of the cultural thing uh and if in some places if you were a woman not covering your head that means you're not married and most likely you are a prostitute that's how they differentiated that, at least in a lot of areas. Um, and St. Paul talks about it a few chapters before. We spoke about it. Uh, I don't think next week was the week before. Uh, I mean, it was not last week, the week after. He says it's not about covering your head. It's not, it's not going to make you holier or not covering your head. It's going to make you less holier. It's not about this. 
It's about your heart, how you pray, all of this. But because of the culture, so people don't right away assume, like if you're not covering your head, that means you don't have a, a husband, you don't have a father, you're not living a, a righteous life. Just cover your head. Make it easier and just cover your head everywhere. In the church, outside church, whatever. Mm. Any other questions? Lord? Right. Um 15. 15 is a bit I got, long. I got Salim to read next, Father. Okay. Let's uh, let's see. Let's oh, uh, did... okay, tell me. Uh, one thing. Uh Wasim had a question in chat. Atheism consolation of philosophy tries to explain that mystery. I don't know. If that's what you say, Wasim, and if it's right, good. I was just commenting on earlier what we were talking about. Um, I forgot who it was who mentioned um, kind of the mystery between free will, man's free will, and God's uh, foreknowledge. So I was just commenting that there's a book from St. Boethius who kind of tries to explain that and how that works. I haven't read it, but um, yeah. That's actually uh, a good source then to look into. Uh, chapter 15, let's see if we can read, let's divide it into half because it's a bit long. Uh, it's 58 verses. Maybe, we, you know, let's, uh, it's, it's all about resurrection. Let's read till 34 at least. Let's just divide it 34 first. Okay. Witnesses. Yeah. Witnesses to the resurrection. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you be believe in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas then by the twelve after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep after that he was seen by James then by all the apostles then last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed the centrality of the resurrection. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yet, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead did not, do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men the most pitiable the resurrection and the kingdom. But now Christ is risen from the dead and he and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterwards, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. 
for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is expected. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in, your, in, in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. For in the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to, the, awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to, you, to your shame. Is, is, Thank you. Uh, that was, yes. Okay, what is he talking about here? What was, what is the problem now? Mind the company you keep. Bravo. Okay, that's good. But especially about why, why, why now, what kind of subject that kind of like, you better watch what, who you, uh, the, the company said evil company be careful of okay. the evil company okay this is all good this is all right and good but like why is he calling them then bad and you know evil and all of this because what kind of teaching now that they're spreading no no resurrection no resurrection he's saying wait a second so beforehand all kinds of stuff that he's trying to teach them, they don't like practices and ritual of do this and don't do that and cover, not cover, speak, don't speak, tongues, don't do tongues, do this, right? But now he's switching to something totally different, which is what, what now is he's dealing with some doctrinal thing, like theological things, like essence, things that they're of essence of the faith, which is what? the most important one that they were people Christians in Corinth that they although believed in the resurrection of Christ they do not believe that the, there is the resurrection of the dead of the people so literally when you die you're gone and his whole chapter here actually is like what are you talking about this is crazy this is wrong and I'll talk more a little bit about it. Steve, you have your hand. You're, you're muted now. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes, now you're fine. Okay. Uh, was this the time of some of the Gnostic teachers? Well, Gnostic, pagans, philosophers, you name it. I mean, in the end, don't forget, they're those Christians or the, the, the Christians in, in Corinth, they were most likely pagans, right? And even when they converted to Christianity, they were still surrounded by all of these teachings and all of these wrong teachings and, and practices. So, I mean, it's so silly at the end, but and that's why he's telling them all of these things. So they definitely say, in, uh, like we read in verse 12, in 15, verse 12, um, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Why? Because Greek philosophy definitely refused this teaching about the resurrection. Um, remember in Acts, when, when, when uh, Paul went to a Athens, what happened to him? What did he do? He preached about what? How did he kind of got into the, the, uh, the Athenians? What did he use? The unknown God, right? Right? The unknown God. And they're like, ha-ha. Oh, I guess he know, you know, 
I guess we he knows about this unknown God. So they listen. When we 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 know that they kind of like yeah, we lost. You know, uh, he lost them. When he talked about what. Uh, Nicolette, if you were talking, you're muted. The resurrection? Exactly. So when he first, St. Paul arrived before to Athens and talked to them about the unknown God, he found a way how to break into them and like talk uh, to teach them about Christ. He's, because uh, if you guys, if you don't remember, when he went to Athens, he found, you know, multiple uh, uh, temples for different gods god of the sun god of the wind god of love god 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 of this god of this and then in in the city there was a temple literally named the unknown a temple dedicated to the unknown god in a way those pagans those greeks were like just to cover our behinds if i can say forgive me they just just make sure you know we have everything covered we don't want to upset anybody so if there's a god that we don't know who he is here's here's your temple here's your temple so we don't offend you upset you yeah you you know all of this so paul saint paul he sees that he's like oh hey by the way see this un this temple that you have for the unseen god or the unknown god i know who he is i know who he is He's Jesus Christ, and he's telling about you know telling about him, and of course these Greeks are like okay, good, good, let's listen. Oh, good, good, and then he tells them, and he died for the sins of the world, and uh, resurrected on the third day, and they're like, see you later, everything you told about him, done, gone. Few. It says in Acts chapter seventeen, actually, it says like only few, kind of like okay, what are you talking about? Everybody else is like me. See you later. So Greeks, pagans, they had no way, if anything, the body was like, okay, it's, it's, once it's, it's done, when it's gone, the spirit goes with it, the soul goes with it. And in a way, the, um, there's this understanding in the pagan religion that the body is the tomb of the soul. Just said, which means you're, you know, you died. You're done, خلص, gone. Your spirit, not going anywhere. Not, you know, nothing is happening. You're just done, done. Just, just there's nothing. So it seems that there were some Christians, and this is very contradicting to each other. Like, oh, we believe in the resurrection of Christ, but, but we don't believe in the resurrection of, uh, you know, of, of the dead. So St. Paul is telling them, whoa, hold on a second. Why would then Christ be resurrected from the dead then? If we're not, you know, he did this, so we also can be resurrected at the second coming. What's the point? It's only become then, it's a historical uh, event. It's, it is a historical event, but it's not just a historical event. It's also a spiritual theological event, divinely event for us now that we granted resurrection. That any not anymore, we're done, we're gone before Christ. Now with Christ, we can um, uh, go back and, and reign with him. Or else, who would, he, who would be there at the second coming then? What's the point of God coming back? What's the point of any of this? If we're not going to end up anywhere, it's just like, what's the point? And that's why he says, yeah. what is the point of the whole resurrection then? Right? Yep. Right? Um, so, I mean, he of course, he puts a lot of words into this, but that's the main idea. He's telling them, now I, he can tolerate in a way back and forth, like, okay, cover your head, don't cover your head, speak this, this, you know. but now we're talking about theological matters, like core, the core of the faith. So now it's like, if we have a, that's why I tell you, if there are people like, there are 32,000, 33,000 Christian denominations, sects in this country, in our country here. Not just because they say I'm a Christian, that means that they're Christian. If there are Christians that tells you oh, Christ didn't, is not the Son of God, oh, Christ is not resurrected from the dead, no. I mean, we don't we don't disrespect them, we don't hate them. God forbid any of this. We don't do any of these things, but we cannot accept them to be this is the right teachings. Just because, yeah, but they follow Jesus. It's like, yeah, what kind of Jesus? So in this matter, this chapter 15, 
It's like 58 verses dedicated for this. Like, oh, we're not playing in here. There is no play. There is no maybe, yes, uh, social, uh, uh, I don't know, historical. No, 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 no. This is, this is a, a very important point for us. God died for us, resurrected for us, so he can abolish death. What do we say? Our main hymn, the hymn of hymns that we're going to sing on Pascha. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling what? Death by death. Death by death. And to those in the tombs, he's stowing light. I mean, this is our whole faith. So he's telling them, what are you talking about? Take that all out of your, your mind. Yes, pagans want to believe whatever they believe. That's their problem. But as Christians, we cannot claim to be Christians and we don't, we don't be believe in the resurrection of us. Like, if we really, that's, if we really live a righteous life, a life that of repentance, a life of humility, a life of love, a life of sacrifice, even with our mistakes, but if we still repent and go back and try to fix our mistakes and work on them, there's resurrection, there's life in Christ, or else who would he, who, who would he talk to? The whole point of God creating us is to at least share his love. Well, if we're all gone, what's the point? What's the point of even creating us? Just so he can enjoy, you know, I don't know, few, you know, some time with people on earth and that's it? No, that can be, cannot be right. That cannot be right. And the other thing I do want to talk about, I don't know if you paid attention to it, verse 29. Oh, uh, it says, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all. He's so smart. He's just like, well, hold on a second. There is this wrong practice that you guys been doing, which is, it was actually, and it's a Jewish, it's a, it's a wrong Jewish practice. And some kind of it spilled also in the early Christianity where let's say, I don't know, my brother, my somebody, you know, my friend, someone dies without being baptized there was this wrong teaching oh you know what i can go get baptized on his behalf for his own you know for his own good the one who passed away and he's telling them although this is wrong teaching but why would you do that even if you don't believe in the resurrection what's the point then of being baptized for someone who's uh, who's dead right so he's like telling them, like, you're even teaching wrong things. He's like, you're like, there's this wrong teaching that you've been also saying that people can be baptized for others. Okay, this is wrong, but I'm going to go with you if this is right. How come, you know, why would you even believe? Uh, how come you cannot believe in the resurrection? If you're creating this new practice of like, oh, I'll just get baptized on behalf of of my cousin, my sibling, my parent, my whoever who passed away and did not get a chance to be baptized when he or she was alive. Very smart of St. Paul. Very, very smart. Any questions, comments on this one? I do have a quick question. So mm. you have a, a like a, a baby who's really sick that hasn't had a chance to be baptized. Do you try mm -hmm. to baptize that baby before you're knowing that they may be passing on within the next day or so? Absolutely. Uh, actually, I can tell from personal experience. Uh, uh, I lost a brother who was 21 days. Um, he had a uh, um, what's called meningitis. And um, again, 21 days, uh, 20, 20 days, 21 days old. Um, and they told us there's not much, I mean, in less, almost 24 hours or so, he was just like, he, there's not nothing basically um, uh, uh, working anymore. And right away, my father ran, grabbed the priest, uh, and um, right away took him to the hospital. So at least some water to be baptized. Of course, we don't. Uh, there's a very close friend of mine. Um, he's he's a priest here in the, in the in our archdiocese, 
uh, they, his wife delivered a baby. It was, I mean, they knew that there are so many problems with the baby right before, you know, giving birth. I mean, they knew the baby won't survive much long. Um, and it only was a few days after uh, they gave birth to her. And right away, the father, the second she came out of, the baby came out of her mother's womb, uh, baptized her right away. Like, did he? Of course not, but like with holy water, you know? And um, it's actually, now you open that subject, um, when it comes to baptisms, um, especially in cases like eminent death, even anybody can do it then. A lay person can do it. Even the fact that says, even to the point in our writings, the, the church writings, it says, you took, you take saliva, literally saliva, if there's no water or you can't take saliva and you say you're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Or this, this is considered a, like a baptism. If for whatever reason, and there are miracles that would happen, that the child somehow regains life, uh, no, no baptism is needed after that. If yeah. anything, the chrismation, only chrismation, because it was not able to, to be chrismated. But never we baptize on behalf of dead people. Got you know it. what I mean? Yeah. And that's, yeah. what he's, that's what he's pointing here. That's what he's uh, pointing here. Like there is this wrong teaching, but anyway, even if it's, even if let's consider it's right, why are you doing it if you don't believe in the? So you're you're contradicting yourselves. Absolutely. Not not you, Nancy, contradicting yourself. I I, the, the I Corinthians, understand. <laughs> the Corinthians contradicting this. Thank you. Very. Oh. Father, I have a question real quick. So when they, what did they believe in back in the day? They were just going to die and there was no afterlife. You just, you pass away and you're done. Or, or was it like a Buddhist? So Information. Not, that's, that's not the Christian uh, practice. The Christian, they were basically only in Corinth, only in Corinth, there was a group of Christians that they believed that once you're dead, you're dead. Although Christianity from day one, I mean, that was the whole thing that started Christianity. That's what the fears it, the fear that uh, that was that was what made it different from Judaism and all of other religions. That there is a God who became man. He died and resurrected in order for us to be all resurrected in the second coming. So, they were some pagans, and now and then it spilled to some Christians in Corinth saying that yes our lord resurrected but we're all never gonna be wake up again once we're dead we're dead and paul is saying and paul is saying no 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 do not do that you cannot think like this this is just wrong hmm. any other questions okay can we continue uh, anybody would like to read the other half or whoever uh, salim was reading I mean, it doesn't matter. Whoever wants to read the second half, please. I can continue. Oh, oh, that's, yeah. Is that for, that's from 35, right? Yes. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, this is all now, this is just like explaining it more and more and more. What is it to be, uh, um, uh, you know, resurrected, you know, the dead, and what, what Christ came for us. What did he do? He trampled down death by death, right? Right. Anyway, thank you. Okay. The manner of the resurrection. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made, made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that the body that, the body that shall be. But mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh, of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are the celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, 
for one star differs from another star in glory. The one who resurrects us. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. The time of the resurrection. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet was sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and he shall be changed. For this corruptible must put an in incorruption, and this mortal must put an in immortality. Him triumphed over death. So when this corruptible was put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you. So he's, again, he's more exploring more and more and talking more about like, no, death, it was introduced to us uh, uh, because of the fall. But with Christ coming, he redeemed us. Now we're granted back eternal life if we live a righteous life. That we always, like we always say. So where do we hear, I'll start from the, from the end. Uh, death is swallowed up in victory. Or death, where is your sting? Or Hades, where is your victory? When do you hear this? Pascha. Where? Where? Where in Pascha? Who, who holds Friday? Christ is risen. Holy Friday. Yeah. Holy Friday. 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 Holy Friday. Uh, but also on Pascha, it's in a very famous thing. I don't want to say, I can't, I don't want to say what it is, the thing. St. John Chrysostom is speech. Yes. Uh, yes, his homily. Yes, it's his famous homily, his famous sermon on Pascha um, that he says, he quotes Hosea. And he says, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? I even in the Old Testament, you know, even in the Old Testament, um, uh, the Jews from the beginning believed in the resurrection of the dead. And the Messiah is coming to redeem them, to offer them life eternal so there's no more death. And we as Christians, and the Messiah came and resurrected for us, and then, you know, we don't, you know, we don't believe in this. He's, uh, he's uh, um, telling them. But then they asked, like, but, but, but how is it going to be? Is it going to be just a world like this? So we go back, like, our passions and, and struggles and all of this, and he's just telling them, no, 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 no. I mean, we don't know exactly. But at the end, it's going to be different. It's going to be how God intended to us. And he gives the example, well, we are now like a grain, like a seed. A seed that is just like small. Nothing, I mean, nothing special about it. Uh, like maybe one color, right? There's not, I mean, it's a seed. And then when you put it in the ground and it grows, what can it offer? What can it be? beautiful plant right you'll see the color you you know you see the beauty so it's like at least we know after our death there is something much better than what we have here what is it exactly we don't know but definitely not like this struggling with bills 
you know, the house bills and I'm struggling, like, you know, how I'm gonna, I don't know, um, um, uh, figure out my, uh, um, I don't know, my problems and how I'm gonna get to the, to work from here and traffic and all. No, no, that's just, it's a life that is in Christ. Uh, how exactly? We'll see, but we know it's a much better life than what we have here. Steve. Unmute yourself. Unmute, please. I click it and then nothing happens. Sorry. Change your computer. <laughs> uh, just to, uh, my understanding is the resurrection comes in two parts, right? We, we get a spiritual body when we physically die. And then at the end of time, there's a new heaven and new earth and we get a new physical body. Oh, I don't know much. Like how those specifics, I don't think, I mean, there are many writings that in different things that they tell you this, maybe this, but in the end, we know we are in a different way that we are now. Like we still have, it says the resurrection of bodies, but what kind of a body, like a body like now? I, we don't know. Um, um we know at the end now that we, you know, when we, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, they can just like incorruptible bodies. It's not like there is no more death after this. There is no more, you know, decomposition. Like you're, you're just, you have this body the way God intended it in a way we can say like Adam and Eve. Like when he created creation before the fall. A, wor a world and a body with no sin in it. Because after the second coming, khalas, there is nothing anymore like sin, corruption. Um, the process, how does that look like? There are, of course, a lot of interpretation and talks, and but like, we'll have to wait for that day. So when we die, it's like, okay, do we have like some kind of a temporary body then? What happened to our souls? Where is our soul? Is, are we just souls then where are these souls then where are they you know okay the second coming is not here yet so are we in heaven are we in hell or like is there a place where some up we don't know there are, again there are many interpretations and writings and all of this but in the end one way to know but didn't jesus tell the thief on the cross today you will be with me in paradise yes Yes, basically saying that he's already saved. You know what I mean? Like he, he, well, he's like like the saints. A lot of saints that who experience God on earth, that they're already got their judgment. So when ju second coming happens, it's already you know they they know where they're going. Um, although, and that's why I don't want to open up the subject in a way too much because there are interpretation and writings about some saints and theologian that tells you. Oh, the second the second coming has already happened, and you'll be like, "How?" Literally, they tell you there are writings they, like they say, "Well, God is outside of time. God is never contained by time, like uh, contained by time." So, already foresaw this, already did this, already you know, we don't know, we don't know where what we can interpret from today till seven hundred years later. We know two things. We are going to be resurrected in that second coming, if we live right, if we get, if we are granted eternal life, uh, and that life will be such a communion and union with God that it's nothing like this world that we live in. Other than this, you can find trillions of interpretations. Good luck to know which one is right. <laughs> uh, how about the father to the prophecy of Ezekiel? When they took uh, took them, uh, he took him to the valley of death, and he showed them all the dry bones. And he said, uh, "You know, uh, I breathe on them, and then they become flesh back again. So I can mm -hmm. create people from not yani, from these bones." Uh, okay. So uh, some they they say that this is the prophecy uh, for. Our resurrection later on when we, you know, then we will be uh, having a new, you know, we are able to identify each other. 
you know, uh, among yeah, our well, peers, among, among our parents? We don't know. We don't know. Because, you know, in, in um, um, you know, when, when he was asked, uh, Michael would like this, because uh, we also talked about it a couple of days ago. Um, when when uh, when Christ was asked who this wife is going to be, which brother, when all seven brothers, uh, uh, you know, married her, because one after one kept dying, and and they're like those Sadducees, like, well, who is she going to be for? He's like, God told Christ told them, in heaven, no people marrying and not married. We all maybe know each. We don't know exactly. He never made it clear for us. We know for sure that we come back not as spirits. We come back with some kind of a body, which a body that can that will be more uh, better, like a better word, better than Healthy. our bodies now. What is it? That's know? that's kind of how I took it. Is that when you come back, like like say for people that die from cancer, or you die without your legs, or you die you can't walk, yeah. that when we you don't. come back you'll be healthy again. Some kind of like, there is no, nothing corrupt. If you make it, if any of us make it to heaven, you know, that's, if you don't, if we don't make it, if any of us don't make it to heaven, no, it is death, basically, forever. Uh, but at least for those who will be granted resurrection, as our Lord teaches, that somehow they come back in the body, because when he resurrected, I, I, I tell you this all the time, what did he do when he first appeared to the, to the disciples? What did he tell them he wanted? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Feed hungry. Me. I'm food. Why? To make sure he is a human and flesh. So he's not just a, a ghost, a spirit. So he's telling them, give me some food. Maybe he's not hungry, but he wanted to prove a point. point. But the, to tell them that the resurrection is in a body. What kind of a body? We know, like St. Paul is saying, it's more beautiful than this body now. Because our bodies now, it's like a seed. Like something small. Something like not much attractive. It's not. But then it will be, when it's planted and it goes, you know, uh, it flourishes and it's a beautiful, you know, tree. It's a beautiful plant. And that's how this next body. Other than this, we can keep pondering and like talking about this, but I don't, you know, we still have one more chapter because, you know, I want, I do want to finish it. Uh, to, I mean, 16 is, anyway, we'll, but uh, any other questions about this? So I would say, let's worry about our faith that we have resurrection, that we all got it grant, granted us this bless, this opportunity and this grace to save us, uh, to be, to redeem us. If we're, if we live this righteous life that he's telling us about, um, and we know that we're going to live with him, um, uh, and you know, rule with him, uh, if we are granted uh, the resurrection. Um, chapter sixteen. Uh, well, I just to let you know we're closing in on the two hours. That's no no, no, about the re the recording. Oh yeah, yeah. So yes, yes. so that you know, sixteen is, is short. We can All finish right. it. Oh, is it uh, almost ready with that? I mean, uh, well, let's read it and then whatever it stops. Just okay. Stops. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do, I do I have somebody to read it? Go on. Okay, go Nicolette, on. go ahead, unmute, please. Uh, now concerning the collection for the saints. And I have given orders to the churches of Galatia. So you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, store it up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whosoever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it be fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. And if, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey. 
wherever I go, for I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while while you, with you, if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has convenient time. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to him, but to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanas, Fortuna, Fortunatos, and Achaiacus. For what, for what was lacking in, on your part, they supplied. For they refreshed my spirit in yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. The Church of Asia greets you. Achaia and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All that brethren... All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, the salutation with my own hand, Paul's. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Um, those the like from uh, uh, verse twenty one uh, to the end. Those the last three verses twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. It's believed that he wrote it with his own hand. Now to put like kind of this his signature on it, because as we know, all these letters before are written by some of his scribes, his students. He literally he'll just tell them what to write, and they write things right. So in this last chapter, of course, what he's telling them in the end. Um, although it is titled Collection to Jerusalem, uh, because what was what was Paul anytime he went anywhere outside of Jerusalem, what did he do? He collected money, right? To bring back to the church of Jerusalem to help the, the disciples and their travels, you know, to take care of them and all of this. We spoke about this a few weeks ago. Uh, and what was the point? Do we know why why he's doing all of this? He's collecting money, not just also to help to make sure that he's providing support to the disciples and the apostles in Jerusalem. That was a very good point. There was another very good point. It's to for him to show the Jews, for St. Paul to show the Jews that actually the Gentiles take their faith very seriously and they care about their kinsmen, about other Christians, especially the ones who even they don't know, they still care about their brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever they are. So they're genuine in their faith, those Gentiles, Christians who were Gentiles, that they're genuine about their faith, that they care about the people, and they give and help, okay? So that's why he's urging, St. Paul is urging the Corinthians um, uh, uh, to, do, to, to, to make sure to do the same, that they collect money, send it to Jerusalem, help the churches, and all of this. Um, he also does tell them, uh, he does also tell them that he does not want just to pass by, he wants to come and spend time with them. Um, he definitely tells them to keep alert, stand firm, and be strong, right? He mentioned to be everything to actually to be also tender hearts, to have tender hearts, and things to be done in what? In love. 
everything to be done in love in Christ. Um, and that's how he um, finishes his, his epistle, right? He tells them, although there's uh, this one verse, if any, uh, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come, like, just make sure you follow Christ. Um, it says, look at the notes, it says, uh, uh, Aramaic for Maranatha, or Maranatha, however. It's like, just God, come and take him. Take, you know, uh, if just let it be, let him go away. If the one who uh, does not love love Christ and the one who does not spread his teaching, uh, any questions about chapter sixteen? About uh, chapter sixteen, this is more of like the ending. You know, not much. He's just telling them to collect money, to love one another, all of these things to be to 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 be alert, watchful, uh, live their faith, but also uh, be tender hearted and do things in love. Any questions about 16 before we wrap up? Sally? He, 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 he's saying in 16 too, mm. on the first day of the week, Sunday, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, mm -hmm. that there be no collections when I come. In other words, I don't want to come and have you just do a big one. Just do it every week on Sunday, make, make a payment, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That's how I see it. Exactly. No, no, exactly. He's telling them make it a habit, not just because, oh, I'm coming. Oh, let's raise money. No, make it always a habit. And that's what we tell people even till today. You know what I mean? Actually, I don't want to, I mean, that's a difference. But uh, we tell it's not just like, oh, there is something to be done. Then we, oh, let's collect the money and do try to. Find. It's like, no, our job is like to set aside something for church every week regardless if there's event or there's no event and then you know if there is something needed this is where we can you know uh help and you know that's how we can help others always be ready to support the church and uh help others and so he does tell them this that's actually yes very true i mean nowadays if you know i mean we've talked about this before we don't do a collection on sundays right for our you know i told you the reasons but I've told you, we've gotten a big hit because of this. A big hit like a, it's a big deficit than it was before. Before we averaged like twelve to 14,000 a year uh, from collection. Yeah. No, no, not a year. A month. Uh, 11, a month. A month. Yeah. A month. A month. A month. Hold on. I said, I said 11 to 12 or 12 to 14,000 a year. It's like around a thousand a month, twelve hundred a month. Are you talking about just cash, or what are you talking about? Collection from the tray. Yes. Hey, the tray, like people's the contribution. Used... Yeah, Abuna. No, 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 Walid. We we rent. We um, we collect. You know the, the not not the uh, the one what people put. We average yeah. two hundred and fifty, three hundred dollars a week, other than the dues. What people put in the basket. That's what I'm saying. You're talking about the cash. People just throw cash in there. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that if makes we, sense. If we if we look at if we look at our, uh, it's like around eleven thousand, thirteen thousand, depending on the years, like here and there. Now we're averaging maybe eighty dollars a week if we're lucky, a hundred dollars a week, because just because we asked people like just do it at the entrance or at, at you know before you enter or on your way out. But anyway, that's a different subject. But the point is, uh, Paul is saying here, just make sure you don't need, don't wait for an event uh, for you to collect for you. Just make sure that it's at least do it like something that weekly or like a uh, um, what do you call it, like a schedule, something that it's always there. I have like, it. Tina has a question. No, I was going to comment when, but but like you said, it's another subject to get into but i've even noticed that people come and go and don't really pay attention to the box out there isn't there a way we can still do collections maybe after okay. let's do the prayer end of the service still do a collection or let's do um let's i do mean the i think we need to revisit that okay let's do the prayer and then we can spend five minutes on this before okay. we okay
Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. We thank you, O Lord, for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We ask for your we ask for your guardians in love and wisdom. For thou art holy now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. All right. Um,